looks like we are live. Yep. Looks like we're live. Awesome. Well, Facebook's in our favor today. Nice. Facebook's there we go. Muted. All right, we got some people coming in here. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Yes, delete. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Hope everybody's having a great week so far. Let me just get some stuff sorted here, and we'll get Dr. Nick in as well. We'll get uh, Dr. Nick in. I cracked my Diet Coke. Hello, can you hear me? Hey, Dr. Nick. Yeah, yes. yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? All right. Well, welcome, everybody, to another live Q&A here at Live Korea on Facebook. Um, for any of the eagle-eyed attendees that noticed we didn't have one last week, we took a little bit of a break, and we're coming back strong this week uh, with a new set of questions. So if you are new to this and have not attended one of these live Q&As before, we do this every Wednesday, typically at 1 p.m. CST here on Facebook, where we take your questions and answer them live. We have a number of questions here today that we pulled not only from our online submission forum, but also from the community at large. Um, what's really cool is we are all, we are taking questions from our submission forum on our website, and I'll drop a link in the chat here. Um, you know, through, uh, after the after the live stream, so you can submit your questions. And if you submit a question and it's picked to answer live on the live Q and A, you get a twenty five dollar gift certificate. So we give away four of those each week, and uh, we have four winners for this week as well. So uh, thank you to everyone who submitted and uh, highly encourage everybody to use the link that we'll provide in the chat to uh, get your question submitted. So uh, yeah, that's 25 bucks, easy money. So with me, as always, I have Patrick here. He's kind of cut off because of our camera, but part of our husbandry team, he oversees all the husbandry activity. And we have Dr. Nick. Uh, Dr. Nick, you look like you're in some interesting places I'm today. I'm at the uh, Why don't you give us a little bit of background? Museum and Aquarium in Tucson. Very cool. Very cool. So Dr. Nick provides a lot of experience from a veterinarian perspective, as well as uh, Patrick provides a lot of experience from his time uh, caring for animals. I mean, you worked back at Petco, you worked for Live Aquaria, you have a lot of experience as well. So we've got a lot of great expertise in this call, and uh, we welcome your questions in the live chat, as well as our questions here we have uh, ready to go. So without further ado, I'll get started. I got a hello from Art. Welcome, Art. We've actually got a few of your questions here today. So uh, glad to see you joining. Let's see who else we got. We've got about five people. Awesome. So I'll get started here. Um, this first one I'll give to Dr. Nick. Uh, tips for keeping discus okay. in an aquarium. So discus are one of the harder freshwater fish species to care for. They do require a specific water quality that's uh, a little different than an average tropical aquarium fish. So most fish, you can keep them at, you know, 72 to 78 degrees and in tap water that's been uh, conditioned to remove chlorine. But discus require usually a higher water temperature, so 80, 82, 83 degrees Fahrenheit is better for discus. They also require very large tanks because they get, they get to be quite big fish. And they're very peaceful, non-aggressive, which is unusual for a cichlid but they don't do well with other aggressive fish or fish that are very busy, very active. So they most of the time need to be kept by themselves or with maybe some smaller fish. I think we mentioned in the past about uh, cardinal tetras are good to keep with pit, uh, discus, uh, but most other big fish, big cichlids are too, too aggressive and too fast for them. So we don't keep them with those type of fish. And then the pH of the water, they prefer very low pH. So they could probably do okay at seven, but preferably 6.5 or even six on the pH scale would be better with very soft water. So water that's along maybe uh, 25 milligrams per liter or, you know, so maybe two uh, DKH degrees uh, carbonate hardness, which is quite different than most cichlids, uh, especially if you're used to African cichlids, they like very hard water, but discus like very soft water. So you want to keep them in an environment where the, the water is soft, the water is warm, and um, uh, low pH, and not a lot of other fish with them. 
Awesome. Patrick, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, discus has always been one of my favorite. Um, they're great. I call them gentle giants. You know, they usually just have a presence in the tank. Um, they can't be with more aggressive fish like Dr. Nick said, because if they are, they tend to get really timid and shy and um, they won't come out to eat and they'll be really stressed. And, you know, that's when kind of uh, they can get. So you got to be care really careful of tank mates. They need to be obviously the big, they have a presence in the tank, be the biggest, strongest fish in the tank. Um, other new world cichlids do really well with them, like rams and epistogrammas, fish that kind of hang out towards the bottom. They'll be kind of scavenge, keep the bottom clean. Um, <clears throat> Discus do like to eat a lot. I mean, they are kept in warmer water, so their metabolism is going to be a little bit higher. So you want to make sure you have a good size filter for them. Um, several feedings a day work best for them as well because of that higher metabolism. And they're, they're grouping fish. So you should have a minimum of, I'd say, four to six, sometimes more, um, because they do establish a pecking order. So uh, it's good to have a group of them, and uh, you'll get really good um, behavior in the tank if you have more than one. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Uh, moving on, this is actually a question that was submitted for our online form on the website. So this came from a Jacob. So congrats to Jacob. You are going to be one of the $25 gift certificate recipients for submitting your question. So thank you. As a reminder, you'll have a, you'll have a link in the chat here after the stream for you to, if you have a question, you can submit your question on that, on that page on the Live Recording website. And uh, we'll pick a winner, uh, four winners each week for a $25 gift certificate. So 100 bucks total for four winners. So um, we've got our first winner here for this week, Jacob. He asks, might seem a bit of an obvious one, but I'm just starting out on reef aquariums. I'm wondering what's the best size tank to get. That's kind of a, I'll let Patrick take that one, but that, yeah, it's kind of open-ended. Right? Yeah, that's a really tough question because uh, oh, there's really no right or wrong. Some people do great with really small tanks and... Um, larger tanks people go with because they can add, you know, put more stuff in there. So, you know, we talked about in the past that, um, you know, real estate's very limited in a reef tank. So um, you really want to have a list of um, compatible animals before you invest anything into the tank. Um, just because if you wanted to set up a tank that say has slow growing acroporas, you wouldn't want to add um, soft corals to the tank because they're going to encroach on the acroporas and take over that space that the acroporas are going to need. So you really need to start at the beginning and look for compatible species, make sure that they all get along. And then you look at the, um, the adult requirements or the necessary requirements that they need to enable to that animal um, for a long time. You know, um, I mean, you can always upgrade, but yeah, you got to make sure you start and you look, at, look for compatible because when you tend to impulse buy is when you get in trouble. You go to a store, you go online, and you see something that's on sale or pretty or something like that, and you add it to your tank, that's when things start to go wrong, you know. Uh, other than that, the smaller tanks are generally reserved for people that um, have a little bit more experience just because the water quality is going to change that much faster. So the bigger the aquarium, the more stable it is and the easier it is to uh, succeed. Okay. It looks like we're running into a little bit of a uh, video interruption here from Dr. Nixon. So hopefully everything's working okay on your end, Dr. Nick. You're getting a little, a little pixelated enough for us, but uh, yeah, I can, can hear you. I'm okay. trying to find a good Wi-Fi spot. Is that better? Oh, okay. Well, you're doing okay. pretty good before. Just so. Yeah, we'll try to make that work. Uh, so congrats, Jack, Jacob, for uh, hopefully this question helps you answer it uh, as far as starting your reef tank. Um, good luck. Uh, as always, you know, like Patrick said, like prior proper planning is the best way to go. Plan it out and try to think of what you want your ends to do as far as your reef record. It'll uh, provide you the best direction going forward. Um, this next one is actually from Yuvin, another entry on our website. When will the banana eel be back in stock? And I'll pitch this one to Patrick also as... Uh, I think that's obviously your, more your more your realm. Ah, uh, yeah. So the banana eel, that's um, a pretty cool fish. Um, I really like that. So that comes from the west. Well, I mean, the range is really the whole Atlantic Ocean. I mean, the tropical Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it can go all the way from uh, the east east coast of Brazil or, or South America, all the way to the west coast of Africa. So it has quite a big range. But the gold. Uh, variation is what most people are after and those are generally 
um, collected in Brazil. So they do come become available from time to time. And um, I have seen them a few times this year, but the price on those has skyrocketed. I mean, it's tripled in price now. I think retail, they'd be a minimum of $1,500. Um, and that's probably for a um, more blotchy one. If you wanted one that had like more solid gold, um, you're probably looking at over $2,000, you can see, so wow. Yeah. So like if I was if I was an Aquarius with the proper tank size for a banana eel, what would be like an ideal setup for me to be thinking about or like if I had my aquarium or if you had a let I me mean, put this a different way, if you were gonna suggest the best aquarium to put a banana eel in that was already established, what would you see? Um, they do get quite large, but they don't require a lot of room per se because they generally are just going to lurk in caves so generally a tank that's probably four feet long by i would say 18 inches wide so your standard 75 gallon to 90 gallon tank would be a good place to start you want to make sure you use really heavy strong rock stuff ideally that isn't going to collapse on each other because they're they're pretty strong animal. they'll dig through the substrate and they'll uh, they'll force their way through a lot of uh stuff so if you have a really delicate rock work in the tank they may uh, cause like a uh, a rock slide or avalanche or something like that yeah for sure but um tight fitting lid they like to get out for sure um no holes whatsoever in the lid um even if a really small one they'll, they'll, they'll try to get out and they have very large mouths they're very strong um very poor eyesight so anything that moves really slow uh anything that comes near them uh, like even a shadow, for instance, I mean, they lunge at it and grab it, uh, even if the fish is too big for them to swallow, so they may injure themselves, so or injure the fish that they're preying on. Um, so you want to make sure that you use uh, tank mates would be wide bodied fish, like larger angel fish, um, butterfly, stuff that's really like, you know, nothing slender. That's what I'm getting at there. And I would always try to make sure you feed that fish prepared frozen food nothing live because then uh, if they get into the act of preying you know predation in the tank they're going to go after other tank mates whether they can eat it or not for sure so if they get used to eating off the tongs or something like that that's ideally what you want you want that eel to be more or less trained so you can feed it with tongs <laughs> by hand, but... not by hand <laughs> but with tongs yeah, yeah we, 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 the aquarium or the uh the systems we have eels in here we've got clear sciences no hands, just yep. no hands. Yep. So, all right, thank you so much. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pitch this one to Dr. Nick. This is from a Virginia, another entry from their website and another $25 gift certificate winner. Uh, so congrats to Jacob, you've been in Virginia so far. Uh, Dr. Nick, Virginia is curious, how do you tell what sex an angelfish is? And maybe there's a way to do this for a marine or freshwater yeah. or similar. So. What, what would be your thought? With most cichlids, but angelfish, it, uh, South American cichlid, it's very hard to dis to determine the the gender if they aren't sexually dimorphic, meaning that there's a different color between male and female. So some species of cichlids or tropical fish will have different colors between a male and female. Angelfish, freshwater angelfish, don't. Um, there are a few characteristics that as they get mature and are starting to breed, the females will tend to get a fuller abdomen as they develop uh, eggs inside of them. And the, the males will become a little more aggressive swimming around the, the, the females and uh, trying to, to spawn, uh, to pair up with them. The, um, the, when they're in the breeding season, there's a little uh, papilla that sticks down from the vent and that's the, in the females, it's called, called an ovipositor. And the female has a, let's see, I'm gonna make sure I get this correct. The females is, is more rounded and the male is pointed, um, the ovipositor. And if you're looking at a pair of them, it's easy to distinguish the difference between them so you can tell which is the male and female. If you're only looking at one, you have to look very carefully and see what the tip of it looks like. If it kind of goes to a, a, a sharp pointed tip or if it goes to a rounded blunt wide tip and those are often only visible during the breeding season uh, there are a few other characteristics sometimes the males will, will get a little more robust with a little more uh, uh, pronounced foreheads um, 
And mm -hmm. when you have a pair that's actually spawning, you can differentiate them pretty easily once you know what to look for. If they're not in the spawning time, you may not see an ovipositor and it may not be obvious. So in those cases, if you're wanting to breed them, it's best to get five or six of them and hope that among those you'll get a, you know, one or two males and females that will pair off. Um, for uh, saltwater angelfish, maybe uh, we'll, we'll pass that on to Patrick and see if he can uh, notice the difference on those. Yeah, and some some angelfish, um, you can. There is definitely a color variation. Like, hey, let me think. Like, probably scribbled angels is probably a good example where the um, females will have more of a spotty pattern, while males will have like kind of a zigzag pattern. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty obvious. But generally, with angelfish, the um, the larger ones in a pair would be the male. Um, but it's not always very easy to tell and it's very difficult to get a pair for sure because um you need a very large tank even if you do have a pair because they will, they need their space mm -hmm. for sure awesome well thank you both for that one um just as a quick reminder if anybody who's new joining the stream thank you first of all for taking time out of your afternoon wherever you are um we do this every wednesday at 1 p.m csc this is our live q a we have uh, Patrick with us here. We have Dr. Nick where he is in Arizona. And so we're bringing a lot of expertise, a lot of knowledge and experience to this call so that you as a hobbyist can benefit. So we um, greatly welcome any questions that you may have about aquarium keeping. If something's, you know, on your mind or something's stopping you, even a question for a friend or a family member that may be, uh, you know, have a question or dealing with a challenge. Welcome those questions, uh, of course. Feel free to share it with any of your friends and family members too. It's a great opportunity to just get free uh, expert advice from people who know what they're talking about. Um, so uh, just another reminder too, again, this is Wednesday, every every Wednesday, 1 p.m. CST for this live Q&A we're in right now. But as another reminder, um, a lot of people may know this, but just in case you're new, uh, every Monday at 7.30 p.m. CST, we have a live sale. We call it a live dive sale. So we offer up in that live dive sale exclusive deals on WYSIWYG Aquatic Life from our divers in WYSIWYG store. So that's freshwater fish, uh, marine fish, corals, inverts. Uh, we always have a lot of different things that Patrick is working hard to try to, you know, find that's in good quality condition and ready to be offered up uh, to uh, to you guys at, at a discount that's only available through the live dive sales. So that usually includes like big discounts somewhere, sometimes up to 50% off on some items, uh, freebies like our cleaning cloth or static clings or even uh equipment like last week uh just this past monday we gave away a free pump and, and we've given away free filter media and, and or not filter media, filters and all sorts of free stuff that's always part of the part of the program so not to mention gift certificates free money uh so definitely go check out facebook our facebook event page on live aquaria and you'll see that we have recurring events set up not only for this live q a here and now but also for our live dive sales every monday night so uh, just quick shout out. Um, yeah, on the next question. Uh, this came from Lee. Uh, Lee said, since my brother added the anemones, three of them, my fish hide and do not swim through the aquarium. Patrick, I'll let you handle that one. Uh, so the first thing that came to mind was possibly that um, the fish got stung by one of the enemies. That's a possibility if they've been in that established tank without an enemy. Um, Maybe there was a you know an accidental brush with one of them, and you know the fish got stung and is now hiding. You know something like that would definitely affect the behavior of the fish. Um, the other possibility I thought was maybe just the addition of the anemones was enough to um, stress the aquarium to the point where the fish would hide. You know maybe they're just not used to people sticking their hands in there or new additions or, or whatnot. But those are about the only two things that I could think of that would. Um, and also behavior. maybe the addition of the new animals increased the bio load which caused some ammonia to go up which could be affecting the fish so it'd be wise to check the water quality now that the new fish are in there or the new anemones are in there just to be sure it's okay for the fish as well yeah anemones create a, a lot of waste so if uh, mm -hmm. um if the, the owner there is is feeding the anemones, you know, because they, they'll eat a substantial amount. They're pretty opportunistic eaters. I mean, um, they'll go, say, in the wild, they could 
eat every day or maybe there may be a, a stretch where they don't eat for a couple of weeks. So they're opportunistic. I mean, if food is going to land in them and the owner is going to feed them every day, they're going to produce a lot of waste and grow very quickly. So to Dr. Uh, Nick's point there, yeah, if the owner is feeding the enemies daily, which you don't have to do, feeding them once or twice a week is sufficient because they have a very slow metabolism. They, they, don't, they don't grow very quickly. But if you're feeding them, they're going to eat and they're going to produce a lot of weight. And that's going to affect the water quality, which then will affect the other fish in the tank. So. All right, good stuff. Thank you both. Uh, on to our next question from Art, actually. Hopefully, Art, you're still in the chat. This came from you. Thank you for submitting. Um, he says, it's mixed reef, 32 gallons. Phosphates are almost zero. Nitrates right now are at 10 to 12. I've been seeing a lot of commentary on the internet to keep phosphates and nitrates in a ratio to each other. I've also seen commentary on the internet that nitrates as high as 100 or more are okay. My understanding is you want phosphates near zero and nitrates under 10. What are your recommendations? Uh, you take that one, Patrick. Well, I can say it is it is challenging when you're dealing with with multiple hobbyists because um, you know Dr. Nick probably knows about this too. If you tend to neglect your aquarium, the fish in the tank will, as it, as the water quality changes, they will adapt to that that new you know parameters. For instance, so there are you know one person with an overly clean tank, the same animals are thriving as somebody who has a overly dirty tank. Animals may be doing just as well. But because it happened in such a gradual, you know, time change that um, that's what happens. But it's not the general rule. So the general rule in a reef tank, you want to have your phosphates near zero, not at zero, but near zero. So 0.5 parts per million would be ideal all the way up to, I'm sorry, 0.1, right? 0.1, yeah. Wrote that down point one, yeah. yeah, so I wouldn't forget. Yeah, 0.1 mm -hmm. to 0.5. Um, is your ideal range and your nitrates you want to have around one to two parts per million so you want it near zero but not at zero so that's the general rule um but it's not necessarily going to be the same from hobbyist to hobbyist you, know? you may have some uh reef animals that will thrive in dirtier water like a lot of um soft corals for instance like zoanthids and zinnia and stuff like that say in the wild they tend to be fine found in the more murky water so there's going to be more nutrients there. Um, so if you have a tank that's super clean, like you're trying to keep Acropora, for instance, like we were talking earlier, they like to be in a tank with lots of flow because they don't like waste sitting on them or around them. So um, generally speaking, those two should not be kept in the same tank because of that, you know, very variation in water quality. Because you'll have your Acropora will be thriving, your Xenia will be crashing, or the other way around. Um, so the general rule, yeah, um, like Art was suggesting, yeah, you want to keep them close to each other, but you want to keep them as near zero as possible. And if the phosphate is, does go up, you will start seeing a lot more algae growth, especially in the freshwater aquariums. So if you're, if you're constantly fighting algae, I think we've talked about this question in the past as well, that the phosphate is often a problem when you're starting to see a lot of uh, algae growth. And phosphate can be in your tap water. So unless you're checking your tap water, just doing water changes may not lower phosphate if you have it in the tap water. Yep. Yeah, and if you have an algae bloom in your tank, that's going to choke your coral out. I mean, Art uh, mentioned 100 parts per million for nitrate. I mean, I could only see probably fish tolerating that i couldn't really see um coral yeah or invertebrates yeah um for sure so all right cool well thank you both um i just want to take a quick moment to let everybody know that we do have a freshwater fish sale going on right now um it started yesterday and actually ends through tomorrow so if you're looking at some good deals on freshwater fish go over to liveaquary.com we got a great selection available on the website if you go to liveaquary.com there's a big big hero image right there. When you get to the home page, you click on that and you get straight to the selection we have, promo code there. So go check that out. I think it's 20% off freshwater fish selection we have. So some great deals out there right now. So highly recommend everybody go check that out, get some good deals. Uh, that's through tomorrow. So just a heads up. Uh, so it looks like we got one last question on our list here. Oh, uh, real quick, Art, you're welcome. I see you're saying thank you for the info. 
And then it looks like we got Ricardo. What's up, everybody? Welcome. And Brandon, you're welcome for the info as well. So great to see some activity in the chat. Thank you guys for taking the time to join us. And, uh, you know, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to share them. Uh, we actually have one question left on our list today. Uh, unless you guys have some other questions, we'll go through this. And then I think that'll be it for today. So um, this question I saw kind of out there, I thought it was kind of an interesting question I, I personally hadn't thought of before. Uh, and maybe this is kind of no right or wrong answer. But uh, the question was, should I slow my aquarium pump flow at night? Interesting. Uh, so kind of an interesting one, but I, I couldn't really think of any reason. I, I, I thought, I've never well, heard, you guys might have heard some experience that question before. Um, I don't think it's, it's of any value, but I, I will throw out uh, a situation that happened with a koi pond where the uh, client of mine had a koi pond and they had a waterfall. And at night, they figured, well, I'll save electricity. I'll shut the waterfall off because nobody's there to watch the fish and the waterfall. We don't need it. Well, then they shut the waterfall off at night. They did it for a while, no problem. It got to be July. The water was hot. Hot water holds less oxygen. So over a period of time, the oxygen level went down. And sure enough, one morning when they came out, the fish were dying. Some of them had died somewhere at the top gulping for air because that uh, waterfall or the water pump in this case is also responsible for oxygenating the water by circulating it. And if you shut it off, even at night, the fish still need oxygen. And if you have algae in the pond or, or the aquarium, those algae consume oxygen when there's no light. So if the light's off and you have plants, they're actually consuming oxygen. And if your water flow is diminished, you'll have less oxygen. So it's important to keep that water flow going day and night to provide oxygen for the fish. Yeah, and same thing with your biological filtration too. I mean, the bacteria in your biological filtration need that constant supply of dissolved oxygen. Because the last thing you want to do is start losing your bacteria because then you'll have yeah. ammonia spike and it'll just spiral mm -hmm. real quick. So if the aquarium is running fine the way it is, definitely do not touch the pump. Yeah. I mean, the only thing, the things that came to mind when I first saw this question too is like the reasons I've seen people slow their aquarium pump would be during like feeding thing, uh, times of feeding, let's say something like that to decrease, decrease the flow, allow the animals to probably get the food and eat it. Um, I guess it, I guess my personal thought too is that if your flow is that high, you might already need to think about dialing it back already because I would think the fish probably shouldn't have to work so hard to get the food, but that was just my two cents. Um, so yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting um, in uh, something maybe, maybe just kind of a basic question to get out there. So uh, thank you both for that. Um, yeah, if there's no other questions then, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, thank you everybody for taking the time out of your day here to join us. Um, really appreciate any of the questions that were submitted. We actually have five winners this week, so we'll get those guest certificates uh, out. So congratulations to Jacob, Yuvin, Virginia, Lee, and Art. You guys have all received a $25 gift certificate. So I know I said there's only four, but we actually got through five questions today. So you guys, uh, you guys are walking home with 25 bucks, so we'll reach out to you and get that gift certificate to you. So um, anyway, thank you everybody for taking the time. Um, Brian says, scary things can happen at night in tanks. I hate waking up to dead fish or falling coral. Yeah, it's sort of like the night worst nightmare. I know I've had instances where, not necessarily during the night, but next day I find stuff typically. But um, yeah, you won Art, congratulations. So thank you for your question. And uh, I'll put a link in the chat here for the question submission page on our website. So if anybody was is interested in getting their question answered, as well as a chance to win a twenty five dollar gift certificate, you just simply have to send your question. There's no limit to the question. Just go ahead and send along whatever you have, and we'll do our best to get them answered live. So thank without you. further ado, thank you everyone for taking the time. Uh, thank you, Patrick and Dr. Nick. Week. Thank you for taking your time and lending your expertise. Yep. See yep. you next week. Don't forget one uh, seven thirty p.m. CST on Monday. I'll be live, live dive sale right here in our Wisconsin facility. Got some deals coming for you. So thanks, everybody. Bye.